is, uh, again, a privilege to, to be here. Last time I was here, I shared with you that we had stepped out in faith, and we had ordered uh, the paper for the next five million great controversy books. And for those who are a little more practically minded, uh, as far as the weight-wise, that is 125, 125, 53 tractor trailer loads of paper. Amen? If you line those trucks up, give a little distance in between them, that's two miles of tractor trailers hauling paper for God's Word. Amen? Amen. And I think I re uh, reminded you last time I was here, the, the project to get, and this is all to God's glory, to get the book in every home in the state of West Virginia was approximately uh, 730,000 homes. Every home in the state of West Virginia has now received the full text Great Controversy book. We're told by inspiration of all the books I've ever written. She says, I want that book out more than any other book. Have you read it recently? If you have, then you understand the reason why it's so important for today. Because it does give the past, the present, and the future of history and where God's people are going and where they need to go. So we're going to need your help, folks. Again, we've stepped out in faith, and we're told not to think so small. We've got to think outside the box. And uh, so we're going to ask God's people to help us to do this. Now, we saw on the mission spotlight, and they talked about Japan, and they talked about those parts of that part of the world, and it was talking about all these hundreds of millions of people that don't know the truth, and there's just a relatively handful of Seventh-day Adventists, and, and one would look at that and you'd say, well, we're going to be here for another 150 years. Because the way we're doing evangelism, the way we're doing things right now, we can do it, and it's all good, but it's going to take a long time if we're thinking about it in that way. But I want to remind you, there was a fellow by the name of Martin Luther, and he took a piece of literature, and he hung it on the door of the church at Wittenberg in 1517. From that point, and it, what did it do? It exposed the errors of the papacy. What does the great controversy do? Okay. We're told in just a week or so it went all through Germany. In a few weeks more, less than a month, it went all through Christendom. He didn't tweet. He didn't Twitter. He didn't email. He didn't use CNN or Fox News. It was the Holy Spirit from literature. I believe that's going to happen again. We're told in page 300 of Testimonies of the Ministers that we are going to be amazed at the simple means God uses to finish the work. Simple. What happens when these books, and of course my wife and I, we give them to political and religious leaders, people that you see or hear about on the news, every day, radio talk show hosts, movie stars, that we've been able to, by God's grace, through His power, through His glory, to be able to place it in their hands, whether it be the vice president, the president, or whether it be the whomever, the Lord opens those doors to be able to do that because we're told that many of those people will join with God's remnant here at the end, even though Satan has his people there as well. And what's one of the reasons to bring on the Sunday law based on what the Spirit of Prophecy says in the Great Controversy. Can you remember one of them? Dealing with Washington, D.C.? Save the planet. Save the planet, but what else? Political corruption is destroying love and justice, and even in free America, to win the favor, uh, to win the favor of the people, the rulers and the legislators will vote a Sunday law. And friends, what we're seeing happening in America and around the world right now is a precursor to the Sunday law. You will not be able to buy. You will not be able to sell. You will be controlled. You will be restricted. You can't go to church unless you do thus and so. So we see it's, it's happening. It's happening. So get on the website or get on the website. Look up dealing with great controversies. And someone wanted me to mention this, that if you look up the great controversy uh, and just put search, 
you'll find that there's uh, all kinds of slides and de things dealing with the great controversy, hundreds of them that uh, you can enjoy and look at and understand more about history because the great controversy is because one day somebody is going to get a hold of this book. They're not going to like what's in it. Right now, you, in the last, I forgot how many months it's been now, you've had 90 Roman Catholic churches uh, vandalize in the United States, not counting Canada, uh, burned, set on fire, statues torn down. How long do you suppose it's going to take before they link that book with the hatred towards Rome. How long do you think before they bring those two together? They're going to accuse that. True history, they're going to use that to try to cancel things out. So let's do what we can while there's relatively time of peace. The message this morning is the ultimate rescue. Bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise you. We thank you for your blessings, your goodness. Oh, Lord, please give me the words to speak. Helping to know. I'm just a GED. I'm just a God-educated disciple. So give me the words you want me to speak. Give me what you want me to share. May your holy angels be here. May your Holy Spirit bring conviction to our hearts of what we need to do. Uh, we're tired of going around this mountain, Lord. It's time to go up. And let's go home. Let's get the work finished. And let's get serious about our walk with thee. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving. In Jesus' glorious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of rescue um, stories that you've heard throughout the years. Um, some of them, I brought a few that I looked up and uh, brought them out, and I'll remind you, uh, for those that are older, not for the younger people, you probably wouldn't remember these, that's for sure, but uh, the older folks would remember them. How about in Munich? You remember Munich massacre in the 1970s? Anybody remember that, the older people? Huh? The Munich massacre, the terrorist attack on Israel Olympic team, members of the 1972 Summer Games in Munich, orchestrated by uh, affiliates of the Palestinian milit militant group Black September. Do anybody remember those days? Oh, it was news. It was worldwide. It went everywhere, didn't it? You know, uh, soon as soon as someone gets a little upset about the great controversy or something we're preaching and teaching, it's going to make the news. You remember when... Uh, uh, President Obama was in office and they wanted to have everybody have all this health care. And one of the things they wanted to do was force the Catholic Church to provide contraceptives. You remember the stink that was about that? And it was all on the news, all over the place. I saw it on Al Jazeera News, folks. French, French news, German news. It went all over the place. So that's how quickly the message of the three angels can also go as well very, very quickly because we're going to be surprised and God's going to cut his work short in righteousness. So we know that there was this, so there was a, there was a plan made uh, that they were going to go into the Olympic village and the German uh, army, or not the army, they used the police to go in and they finally negotiated with them and they got all the hostages on helicopters and they flew them over to an air base not far from the Olympic village and uh, someone uh, announced that every, all the hostages were set free, and that really wasn't proper because one of the terrorists threw a grenade in one of the helicopters and killed all but one of the hostages. So it was a rescue attempt, but it wasn't very successful, was it? It was a rescue attempt, but it wasn't very successful. We have another one. It was in 1976. Israeli commandos rescue hostages in Entebbe, uh, Uganda. You remember there were some terrorists got on a plane, plane 5, 539, Air France, flying from Tel Aviv, and it was hijacked when it stopped in Athens. They held these hostages. Again, there was a rescue attempt that took place. The hostages had... Uh, uh, they had set a, a deadline of July 1 of that year and that they were going to kill the hostages if they didn't pay the ransom or do what they said. The Israeli forces rushed to the terminal. Three hostages were killed in the crossfire. All the hijackers were killed. Not completely successful. There was an attempt made. It was a heroic attempt made to save these people 
and get them out of hostage. You know, hostage situations, we sang the song, Rescue the Perishing. How many are we trying to rescue? People are willing to give up their lives. We had another situation in Iran. You remember that when the shawl of Iran was put out of office and the students and people over there got surrounded the embassy in Tehran and the Ayatollah Khomeini took charge. It was a political op uh, operation, it turned out to be. And so they were trying to rescue 52 hostages that were held and they were held for like 14 months. 14 months, they were held hostage. Jimmy Carter, then president, uh, sent troops over there. Uh, some of our elite troops went over to try to rescue them. Another failed attempt. All eight, eight um, Delta Force type people were killed in that rescue attempt. Very sad. Uh, what about today? Do we have any rescue attempts going on today? How about Afghanistan? Are there still people there that they're trying to rescue? I just heard a program coming here yesterday that there's still, there's, there's multi-millions of dollars that are going into a rescue plan. There is uh, aircraft are being donated for flights and things to get the people out, and they're still not able to get them all out. Mostly failed rescue plans. The Bible has rescue plans too in it, doesn't it? I think of some, I think of Noah. I think of Noah and his family. A rescue plan. A rescue plan. Noah did what he was asked to do and God told him to build an ark. It never rained before. Isn't that right? You think how ridiculous Noah might have looked at that time? when he was trying to build this ark, and people say, hey, this old man, he's, he needs to be over, uh, he's a 1096, he's a mental subject, he needs to be locked away. It's never rained before. How ridiculous is this? But it says, by faith, Noah being warned of God, of things of seen not yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark in the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith, Hebrews eleven seven. While Noah was giving his warning message to the world, his works testified to his sincerity. You know, there's an old saying is, your actions are so loud I can't hear a word you say. We as Seventh-day Adventists are here to try by God's grace, to warn, to help rescue a dying world. How many of the people in our neighborhoods or families take us seriously? Because we think that uh, by just saying it but not living it makes, doesn't make any difference. But folks, it does make a difference. We cannot, we cannot tell people that Jesus is coming soon, the signs are all around us, get ready, and then next week stop by their house and ask them to feed the dog and the cat because you're going on a cruise somewhere. It tells a different story than what you're saying. While Noah was giving his warning message to the world, his works testified to his sincerity it was thus that his faith was perfected and made evident. He gave the world an example of believing just what God says. Are we as a people giving the example to our families and our world of exactly what God has said? Do, are we just talking about it? Or are we, by God's grace, living it? There's a big difference, isn't there? Matter of fact, I'm a prodigal son. I left the church for 34 years, and one of the major reasons why I left the church is I heard what they said, but I saw what they did. And I said, well, if this is Christianity, who needs it? 
Now, friends, I never, never doubted the Advent message. I always knew it was true. Sadly, I've sat in a bar room with a bottle of Budweiser in one hand and a Marlboro cigarette in the other, in between dirty jokes, tell the guy next door on the bar stool next to me, Saturday's the Sabbath. I never doubted the message, but I wasn't willing to play church. If I'm going to play church, I might as well just go ahead and do something else, because you're not going to be saved that way, are we? It says, he gave the world an example of believing just what God says. All that he possessed, he invested in the ark. Hello? Everything he possessed. Are we laying everything on the altar? You remember in, in the early writings, it tells us we are to lay everything on the altar. Be willing. Be willing. We're asking right now, Lord, if it's time, if our place is to be sold, then send the buyer. Let's get it done so we can get more printed and get the word out more quickly. If somebody said, well, where are you going to go? I said, I don't know, but God does. Amen? Amen. He's got it covered. He knows. He knows what's best for us. He'll never let us down. You agree with that? Now listen to these statements about Noah's time. The violence which fills the earth will exceed that which existed before the destruction of the old world. Think we're already here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 92. The Andalusians, they delighted, delighted in destroying the life of animals and the use of flesh food, hindered them still more, rendered them still more cruel and bloodthirsty until they came to regard human life with astonishing indifference. Are we seeing that today? Hmm? Women can have their children and all be born and yet they want to give options to see if they can put that baby to death even after it's born. Astonishing. Some that are uh, children's doctors that are involved in those kinds of things. The rescue mission. God did send the rain, but God did rescue God's faithful people on the ark. We do not need a secret rapture, folks. God is able to carry us through all the way, amen? amen, and protect us like he did Daniel, like he did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and like he will do his faithful people here at the end. He'll do. Only with thine eyes shall we receive the ward of the wicked. The plague shall not come nigh thy dwelling. Is that true or false? It is so true. It is so true. We have another rescue mission that took place. Israel was rescued out of Egypt. Is that quite a rescue mission, wasn't it? I forgot how many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that were rescued. You remember how they were brought to the Red Sea? And you got the armies, the enemy armies behind you. You got the mountains, you got the water. What does God say? Go forward. Can't see past it. Can't see the dangers. And we'll tell you what. Faith will override fear. Faith will override fear if we let it happen. And what does the Bible tell us? Exodus 14, verse 21. It says, the children of Israel walked across the Red Sea, and it was dry. Didn't even have mud on their sandals, sister. Awesome God. Awesome God. He means what he says. He says what he means, amen? And he's more than able to carry it through. We know how Israel was, you know, when the death angel went by, the firstborn was to be slain. 
And what kept, what separated those who had children slain and those who didn't? The blood on the doorpost. What's it going to be here at the end? The blood on the doorpost of our hearts representing the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? He's coming, and He's coming soon. That same, that same bottom of the Red Sea where they walked through and they didn't even get the sandals muddy destroyed all the Egyptian army. The most mighty, powerful army in the world at that time. Not one escape, the Bible says. We have another, and it was mentioned in Sabbath school, but we have another rescue mission. Turn your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 12, please. Acts chapter 12. Herod Agrippa I, he'd already, he'd already taken uh, James. He'd already taken James, the apostle James, and had him beheaded, and it pleased the Jews so much, so what did he decide to do? Ah, let's, let's lock up the Apostle Peter. Let's, let's have him executed. But it was the Passover, and so we're told that because of the Passover, they wanted to wait till the Passover. They didn't want to get the people all upset doing that, so they were going to wait till after the Passover and have him executed and have the same type of execution by the sword. And uh, we read in Acts chapter 12 and verse 1, now about the time of Herod, the king stretched forth his hands and vexed certain. He, he persecuted the certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And verse 4, and when he had uh, apprehended the apostle Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter or after Passover, to bring him forth to the people and have him executed. Who was watching him? Hmm? Four quadrants? How many is that? Sixteen. Sixteen Delta Force Roman soldiers. The Green Beret. SEAL Team Six is guarding Peter in the inner prison. He's in maximum security. And if you read in inspiration, his cell was carved out of a giant rock. There was no mortar. He couldn't pull the mortar out and take blocks out and escape. It was solid rock. And he's got 16 soldiers guarding. His wrist on the right hand, shackled to a soldier. The other wrist... Shackled to another soldier. Soldiers at the gates. There were three different gates. Had soldiers within and soldiers without. They wanted to make sure this rascal didn't escape. Why was Agrippa so determined to have that happen? If you go back to Acts chapter 5, you'll find that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had the disciples imprisoned. And it says, at night, an angel came and set them free. What were they told to do, sister? Go preach. Preach the word. Don't stop preaching just because they locked you up. I'm setting you free so you can go out and preach some more. Amen? And brother, that's the straight testimony that they were supposed to preach. It wasn't this, it wasn't uh, pablum. It was get right or get left. Isn't that right? Did Noah preach? Well, you know, you're okay, I'm okay. Why don't you get on? Get on board. No. But we're trying to do that, I think, too often here today. But it goes on to say in verse 5, And I was in the city, wait a minute, let's see, chapter 12, verse 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. You know, I've always wondered why do we wait till our children have left and gone into the world before we really start praying for them as a church? Why aren't we coming together and fasting and praying for our children before? Could it make a difference? 
There's power in prayer, isn't it? Sure. A lot of prayer, a lot of power, a little prayer, no power, no prayer, no power, correct? But it says here in Acts of the Apostles, page 144, the death of James caused great grief and consternation among the believers. When Peter was also in prison, the entire church engaged in fasting and prayer. Don't have to answer me, but when's the last time you've been in your church, wherever that might be, where the whole church unites in fasting and prayer? And I'm not talking about a half-hour prayer meeting. I'm talking about some serious fasting and praying. Do we expect to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Do we expect that? Do we expect to have it if we're not pleading for it? No. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It says the whole church, Jesus said in Matthew 17, 21 and other places, some things only come by fasting and praying. Matter of fact, if you're like me, it wouldn't hurt us to have a, a meal or two missing. You know what I mean? We'd be a lot healthier. Our minds would be a lot more clearer. It goes on to say, the church, while Peter was still held in prison, the members of the church had time for deep searching of heart and earnest prayer. They prayed without ceasing for Peter. Do we do that today? Have we done that today? When's the last time we've done that? I have to think way back for most of us, for sure. What about Elijah, who is uh, certainly the prophet of God? You remember Elijah was praying for rain. He sent his servant out. Look in the eastern sky. Did anything happen? No, he came back. No, don't see nothing. Elijah went back and prayed more. He came back, nothing. Prayed again. Six times he prayed. No sign of any answer. Remember one thing. God's delay is not his denial, folks. Because we don't receive the prayer as the way we want it immediately, keep praying. But while you're praying, do a lot of heart searching in that prayer. You know, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, what does it say? Examine yourselves. Not your neighbor. Examine yourself. And so we find out because Elijah persevered, he did a lot of heart searching, he continued to pray, he was persevering in his prayer, and God answered that prayer. And then the servant came back with a message that he had been looking for. The day of Peter's execution was at last appointed. Still the prayer of the believers ascended to heaven. Still ascended to heaven. So what happens in this story? In this rescue mission, what happens? Let's go forward. And when Herod had brought him forth, the same night when he was going to bring him forth that next morning for execution, Peter was sleeping. Put yourself in this place. <laughs> You're in maximum security with 16 elite soldiers guarding you. You're going to have your head cut off the next morning. And Peter's sleeping. Hmm? We get a little tight on money or something. So like, oh, how am I going to pay my electric bill? Oh, oh, woe is me, right? Here's he about ready to be executed, and yet he's able to sleep. He's able to sleep. And uh, in Psalms 127.2, it says, He giveth his beloved sleep. He takes care of his own even while they sleep. While others are getting up early in the morning to try to go out and make enough money to feed their family or working all day and real hard and, and going to bed real late at night and they're wringing their hands, it says, 
God takes care of his own even while they sleep. So God sent an angel. He sent an angel. And it tells us, and behold, an angel, verse 7, and behold, an angel, the Lord came upon him. And it, uh, the light shined in the prison and smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise, and go quickly. And his chains fell from his hands. Awesome. <laughs> what a God. We have, we have no clue. We, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the almighty, powerful God that we serve. You know, we were talking about it earlier. We worry about security, you know, and especially you go into the cities, they've got locks and bolts and they've got bars on the windows. The criminals are roaming the streets. The people are incarcerated inside. And yet one angel was sent one night to the Assyrian army and 185,000 Assyrian troops died that night. One angel, just one, just one. And what I understand is that we all have a guardian angel. Boy, do they have some stories to tell us in the kingdom. You don't realize what you put me through. <laughs> Amen? You have no idea what you put me through. Anyway, the angel says to Peter, get up. Put on your cloak. Put your girdle. Put that belt around that robe you're wearing and whatever. Put those sandals on. Let's go. And we're told by inspiration, if you have a chance to read it in Acts, the apostles read the story in there. It's so beautiful. How the gates open. Didn't even creak. Didn't make a noise. And then when Peter gets out and he's finally let through the third gate and he's on the streets, no need of an angel now. The angel disappears. Peter knows where he is and he heads over to where they're praying for him. He's knocking on the door. The servant girl Rhoda comes to the door. Peter says, let me in. She's so excited, she doesn't open and let him in. She runs back to the group and says, Peter's at the door. What'd they tell her? Hey, come on. A little crazy here. I'm telling you, well, it must have been his angel. But Peter consists, consistently banging on the door. And finally they went and they let him in. And we're told that they were astonished. When God answers our prayers, why should we be astonished? Hmm? Isn't that what we're praying for? That he answer our prayers? And we're told there's a criteria about how God will and will not answer our prayers, folks. If we hold iniquity in our hearts, he will not hear our prayers. If we've got grudges against people and we're fighting and feuding, he will not answer our prayers. Somebody will answer them, maybe in a different way, but it's not God. As a matter of fact, I think it says someplace in the early writings that those who followed Christ from the holy by faith into the most holy, where he's interceding for you and me today as our high priest, that did not follow that, were still praying and someone else was answering their prayers. Who was that? Satan himself. That's kind of frightening, isn't it? That's why we need to do a lot of heart Searching, for sure. I had a statement here I wanted to read. It's from Upward Look, page 296. If ever a people needed spiritual perception, vigor, steadfast faith, and power in prayer, it is the people who claim to be keeping the commandments of God and looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. When we're praying and the church comes together, and I'm just convinced of it, that if our churches would come together as a congregation and all join in 
with fasting and prayer. And there's many different ways of fasting. Some have diabetes problems. They can't do quite like maybe some others. But coming together to fast and pray, I think it will be a sight to be seen when God answers those prayers for us. Um, I know there's uh, the story, I don't know if I told you this before, it was out in Kansas. They were having a major drought out there. Terrible, terrible drought, becoming the Dust Bowl. And the church there and all the townspeople and they all came together and said we need to come together. We need to fast, we need to pray, we need to plead with the Lord to send rain. And they all went out the town uh, out there and got together and prayed. And they were all expecting. They kept saying, we expect, we know that God will answer our prayer. But only one little girl brought an umbrella. Only one. Folks, we not only need to ask for prayer and fasting for prayer, but we've got to expect prayer and believe it and believe it. Well, then there's the ultimate rescue. The ultimate rescue. We read in our scripture, if you go back there with me, 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, starting with verse 15. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend with a, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and there shall we, what? And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. There is no failure in this rescue mission. The only failure is going to be is if we're not ready. But that's a personal choice, isn't it? Personal choice. The Revelator says in, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, And when he comes, how many eyes? Every eye shall see him. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 27, As the lightning shineth from the east even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Nothing secret about it. We're also told in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, This same Jesus which has been taken up into you in heaven shall also come in like manner, like manner. We're told we have these promises, amen? amen? And it is a rescue mission that will not fail. It will not fail. Let me um, read to you about God's people delivered. With anthems of celestial melody, the holy angels, a vast unnumbered throng, attend him on his way. The firmament is filled with radiant forms, ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands of thousands. Folks, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of angels. Not only is Jesus coming with His glory, but His Father's glory and all the radiance from the holy angels of 10,000 times 10,000. It's not going to be a dark day that day unless you're lost. No human pen can portray the scene. No mortal mind is adequate to receive its splendor. His glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of His praise and the brightness was of His light. As the living cloud comes still near, every eye beholds the Prince of Life. No crown of thorns now mars that sacred head, but a diadem of glory rests upon his brow. Awesome. 
Amid the reeling of the earth and the flash of lightning and the roar of thunder, the voice of the Son of God calls forth the sleeping saints. He looks upon the graves of the righteous, then raising his hands to heaven, he cries, Awake, 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 he that sleep in the dust of the, at our eyes. I pause there for a moment because we're told by inspiration when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, if he had not said, Lazarus, come forth, every grave and tomb on planet earth would have opened up. But he had to be specific. Throughout the length and the breadth of the earth, the dead shall hear his voice, and they that hear shall live. And the whole earth shall ring with the tread of exceeding great army of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. From the prison house of death they come, clothed with immortal glory, crying, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Praise God. The ultimate rescue. But it doesn't stop there. All blemishes and deformities are left in the grave. Are you thrilled, ladies? No more wrinkles? My brothers and sisters, are you thrilled? There's no more solar panels? All blemishes and deformities. Those who have been in terrible, terrible accidents are burned with fire. They're gone. They're gone. Praise God. Restored to the tree of life in the long lost Eden, the redeemed will grow up to the full statue of the race in its primeval glory. I do not plan to be short much longer. How about you? How tall was Goliath? Anybody have any idea? Said he was, what, six cubits and a span? A cubit was here to here. Again, one anywhere from 18 to 22 inches, they say. And a span was like nine inches. So he was probably somewhere around 11, maybe 11 and a half feet tall. The tallest man I've ever seen was Henry Height, and he was eight foot two, and he was one large feller. They had a special car where they took out all the front seat. He drove from the back seat to be able to stretch those legs out. What does it say? We will grow up into the full stature of the race and primeval glory. The last lingering and traces of curse of sin will be removed. Christ's faithful ones will appear in the beauty of the Lord our God. In mind and soul and body. Think about the mind. Right now, the smartest people on planet Earth only use about 7% of their brain capacity. 7%. Somebody like me is probably maybe one and a half. 7% of their brain capacity. Think about it. That's why we're going to be learning throughout eternity and never really fully grasp it all. It's an impossibility. In mind and soul and body, reflecting the perfect image of their Lord. Oh, wonderful redemption, long talked of, long hoped for, contemplated, an eager anticipation, but never fully understood. The living righteous are changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the voice of God. They were glorified. Now they are made immortal. And with the risen saints are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Remember that, my brothers and sisters. Jesus does not touch planet Earth, his second coming. Remember that. Embed that. Because the enemy is coming to personate our Jesus. But he's not going to be able to come like Jesus is coming perfectly. He does not touch the earth. 
We are caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. Angels gather together his elite from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Little children are born by holy angels to their mother's arms. My wife's mother is going to be quite busy because she's got three little baby boys to be taken care of. So, Pat, you're going to have to help hold some for mom. Hmm. I remember Pat and I were down doing some meetings down in Florida. There was a little break in between, and uh, it was Christmas Day. And we were out for a walk. And we saw this, this woman standing a ways from us, and she was weeping and weeping and just crying and sobbing. We went over to her and I said, ma'am, can we help you? Are you all right? Anything we can do to help you? She said, this is the first Christmas without my Dean. Dean was her eight-year-old that died of leukemia. And it was her first Christmas without her little boy. She was a Roman Catholic. We talked to her for a while, and she started talking and saying something. She mentioned something about purgatory. Her name was Nancy. I said, Nancy, Dean is not in purgatory. Your son is asleep. He's not cold. He's not hot. He's not in pain. He's not in agony. He's sleeping until the resurrection. Pat went over to the car and got a magazine called A Love Stronger Than Death all about what happens when you die, refutes the hell fire, eternal hell fire. I said, Nancy, what God wants, what our Jesus wants is for you and your husband to be faithfully dedicated to him and surrender to him that on resurrection morning an angel can bring your baby Dean and place him in your arms. We miss out on these things, folks. We miss. We, we, it'd be better if we'd never lived. Little children are born by holy angels to their mother's arms. Friends long separated by death united, never more to part. And the songs of gladness ascend together to the city of God. Throughout the unnumbered hosts of the redeemed, Every glance is fixed upon him. Every eye beholds the glory whose visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than any of the sons of men. Upon, his, upon the heads of the overcomers, Jesus with his own right hand places the crown of glory. For each there is a crown bearing his own new name. <clears throat> you don't like your name? It's going to be changed. Remember the song years ago, A Boy Named Sue? He didn't like it. Nowadays, it probably doesn't make any difference. But it did then. The cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed throughout all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. Never will it be forgotten that he whose power created the up upheld the unnumbered worlds through the vast realms of space. The beloved of God, the majesty of heaven, whom, whom cherub and shining seraph delighted to adore, humbled himself to uplift fallen man, that he bore the guilt of shame of sin and the hiding of his father's face till the woes of the lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on Calvary's cross. That maker of all worlds, the arbitrator of all destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself above or from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. The ultimate rescue, folks. Complete it. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. 
one pulse of harmony. Gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. Do you understand why we want to get the great controversy book out to every person on planet Earth? So I was telling people this week when we were out witnessing and sharing, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, folks, and it's not a train. Jesus is coming. Jesus said when you see all these things happening in, in the world, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, as men's hearts failing them for fear of what's coming upon the planet, as they're doing amalgamation with man and beast and also plants, as all these things are happening, he said, when you see them, I'm even at the doors. What does that mean? Doors of what? Some people will say heart. No, he's been at the doors of the heart ever since Adam and Eve sinned. It's the doors of the heavenly sanctuary. And once Christ walks through those doors, probation closes. Let he that be filthy be filthy still. Let he that be righteous be righteous still. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you choose to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords, for you have no idea whether you have tomorrow or not. In my line of work, before I gave my heart to the Lord, there's many times that I've looked people right in their eyeballs and just in a short time, very short time, probation closed, they were dead. It happens all the time. That's why we got to be right with God at all times. Folks, don't get ready. Be ready. Because Jesus is coming soon. Praise God. He's coming soon for the ultimate, the ultimate rescue.